Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 84 of Nostalgia Talk. 84, my God, it's weird that we're in the 80s now. That's close to triple digits, which is kind of scary. Uh, hope you guys had a great Easter. Hope you enjoyed the eclipse. Uh, hope some of you had a great 25th birthday. Oh, no, wait, that was me. Uh, to all of my friends who uh, greeted me on my 25th birthday, you know, that that's a bit of a milestone. I'm now a quarter of a century while also feeling incredibly, incredibly old. Uh, but, uh, but thank you. Uh, but if you're a friend of mine listening to the show, thank you very much for all of the birthday greetings. Joining me today for Nostalgia Talk is Belinda Ward. Hi. Is is today your birthday? No, nope, oh. my, my birthday was uh, about a month ago. It's been a while since oh. I've done this, uh, since I've done the show. <laughs> Okay, because to have a birthday on the eclipse sounds pretty cool. <laughs> well, my oddly enough, today is my uh, friend Rachel's birthday. Um, and uh, I texted happy her, birthday, Rachel. Yeah, <laughs> happy birthday, Rachel. I texted yeah. her, uh, happy birthday to my first friend. P.S. Enjoy the eclipse. Yeah, the day, yeah, that is pretty cool. <laughs> did you see it? No, I, I, I did. It was uh, <laughs> did not see? as exciting as I hoped it would be, but it was still pretty cool. Like, we had the special glasses. Yeah, um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't have those, so I I skipped it. But mm. yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, Belinda is a writer who is most well known for her work with Sesame Street. She's written several episodes and uh, song lyrics, as well as um, co-creator of the Furchester Hotel, uh, the UK spinoff series, and uh, also for Sesame Workshop. She co-created the show, The Upside Down Show, and outside of Sesame Street. She was a writer for The Wubulous World of Dr. Seuss and the PBS series Don Quixote. Yes, that's what I'm writing for Don Quixote right now, actually. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. It, it's funny because the last guest that I had was uh, David Newell, who was uh, Mr. McFeely on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Oh, that's great. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we were uh, we were talking about uh, the new spinoff shows such as Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood and Don Quixote. Um, and, uh, you know, that was a nice little uh, it's nice that they're and I mean, David would agree with me. They're keeping Fred Rogers legacy alive, like not just with his uh, himself, of course, because, you know, like people recognize Daniel Tiger and Don Quixote from the original show. And then you got the spinoffs with the characters from the land of make believe. So it's, it's great that uh, that, that uh, they're keeping Fred's legacy going. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun to write for, and a lot of Sesame people are involved in it, so it's it's fun. Mm -hmm. So let's begin with how did you become interested in the film industry? Um, you know, I don't know. I I really started out wanting to be a, a serious fiction writer. <laughs> that was my my goal, and I was working in um in production and advertising, like as an assistant and. I didn't I didn't like advertising and I I went I had a, a connection at uh, it was Children's Television Workshop at the time. Mm -hmm. um, this is like over over 30 years ago. And I I auditioned, ended up auditioning. I asked them if they ever needed writers and they they said it was a really uh, you know difficult process and you could be a great writer, but not be able to write for this show. So I wrote some audition pieces and, and it just hit. And it was just a really fortunate thing because I just really connected. I connected with the show and the humor and, and you know, my sense of humor, I think, is at that sort of four-year-old level. So I, <laughs> you know, it, was, it was just like seamless, you know, I just... So it was fun. It was it was just great. And I, you know, I I stayed till a couple of years ago, I decided to leave, but I, it was just a great, great place to be with a lot of really funny, intelligent uh, people, you know, it was really mm -hmm. like a family for a long time. Mm -hmm. And like, I've interviewed a lot of writers uh, from the show before. Like I've talked to Norman and Lou and Mark Saltzman, Ed Valentine, mm -hmm. um, Emily Kingsley, uh, Kathy Turo. Speaking of, uh, Kathy, if you're listening, thanks again for helping Belinda and I connect. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, when I was talking to them, they all talked about um, their audition process for uh, for Sesame Street and how that works. Um, do you remember what you wrote to audition with and were they used on the show? I wrote, um, I remember two of the bits that I, I think you had to write four 
um, what they call inserts. I don't know if anybody's explained that to you, but at the time um, there was the stuff that took place on the street mm -hmm. and the stuff that took place, like the Burton Ernie bits that were just Muppets in, in Muppet settings. And I think if I'm recalling correctly, I might not be, but um, I think I wrote four inserts, three or four inserts and two of them got on the show. Um, but when I went to write my full real show, and that was at the time we were breaking up the street story. And so that was like seven, seven connected bits broken up, plus like a couple of inserts. That was kind of like back when the show was done, like laughing at the time. Right, right. And I wrote that and I really bombed on my first show. Like I got hired oh. to do a show and then I just, it was like really bad. And then I did another one and they kept this went on for like two years they just kept feeding me like a show at a time and finally after that i i i got a full contract for a number of shows but um it, they used to it's it's not this way anymore but it used to be a really rigorous audition process um they really cared so much about they valued um you know the producers and the, the show itself valued the keep keeping the characters in character and that you had to really know them and um, you had to be able to write comedy, but on a few di couple different levels. So yeah, it was, um, I just wanted it really badly. I just knew that like, I just connected so much. And so I just kept at it. Mm -hmm. um, so children's television was like always a big interest of yours in the film industry. No, never, never thought of okay. it at all. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't. I mean, I watched as a teenager, I watched Sesame Street. It was like a cool thing to watch, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, who says teenagers can't love Sesame Street? Screw the haters. Right, right. I mean, there were so many there. It was popular on so many levels because it was funny on, on both levels. But no, I never thought of I never thought of writing for film. I really only thought about writing fiction um, and you know, I'd gone, I'd gotten a graduate degree. So in, in writing and I was, you know, that's what I was wanted to do that I did when I wasn't working. Um, but then I just had a knack for this. I knew the first time I, I watched the show because the producer Dulcie Singer told me to go home and watch the show for a month and see if I could come up with any audition pieces. And so I, I did that and I just, had a feeling like there's so many television shows that I turn on where I think I could never write for that. I love the show, but I couldn't write for that. But with Sesame, I just thought like, Oh, I, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't know why, but um, it was just a happy, happy accident. <laughs> so how long were you uh, auditioning for? Cause Lou Berger told me that his audition was six months. Norman told me that he auditioned and it was uh, Jeff Moss was a head writer at the time. And his audition process was competing with another person. Then suddenly Norman's called into a production meeting and he's like, why am I here? And he asks Jeff Moss, do I have the job? Jeff's like, do you think I would have called you here if you didn't have the job? Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, as I said, I, I, I didn't, I wrote those first few audition pieces and they called me up and said, this is, you know, Dulcie said, this is exactly what we do and gave me a show to write but then it took two years of trying to write a show at a time whoa you know that was really yeah it was very difficult you know it was difficult to, there was so much to learn two years of auditioning whoa yeah until <laughs> i got i mean I, they were feeding me shows but until i got like a okay now you're now you get like eight shows or whatever it was at that time for the right. year got a contract for the year. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And you, um, if I'm not mistaken, you joined around, uh, Jim Henson's final years for Sesame street, I believe. Cause I do know that, um, by that time he was busy, like him and Frank Oz both were like going off and doing films, which more often than not were completely unrelated to the Muppets while still trying to keep up with Muppet appearances. And I, I have heard that um, Jim and Frank would occasionally come in and do inserts. Did you get to know Jim Henson very well? No, but he did. I did write some things for him. I didn't I didn't get to know him. I, I by the time I got there, it was that was the case. He would come in and do inserts. And mm -hmm. um, 
So I would write inserts for for the you know his characters and Frank Oz's characters, Richard Hunt, all of those guys. But you know, I did I didn't really. I don't think they they probably had no idea who I was. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Richard Hunt, recently a biography came out uh, about Richard. Uh, I don't know if you have you read it yet. I haven't. No, I, would, I, I neither. Would like neither to... have I. But I'm looking uh, forward to reading it because uh, yeah. you know we've got a crap ton of books about Jim Henson and his legacy. Uh, but a lot of the time, like if I'm with my friend groups, I'm the nerd in my friend groups. Like I got friends <laughs> that are af that were athletes in high school, and I was the only nerdy one. Um, and like, if I'd bring up names like Jerry Nelson, Richard Hunt, Kevin Clash, they'd be like, who the hell is that? Like, they have <laughs> no idea who any of these people are. So it's nice that Richard is getting recognized. I mean, not just among us fans, but like with the public, with this book. Um, and, uh, that kind of makes me wonder, uh, what was Richard Hunt like? Cause I know that he was on set more. Yeah. Again, I didn't really, I, I'm sorry, not a great guess, but I didn't really know him. Um, he um but he was so talented and so funny and so it was just like a you know to have him do one of your bits there was a character well the forgetful jones character and um and i i loved writing for forgetful jones and i loved writing for gladys the cow you know his gladys the cow was just the best um so I really, you know, I just wrote a lot of stuff for him, but um, I was pretty, you know, I was sort of, I think it was like 10, I was sort of in awe of everybody. I don't think I said much of anything for about 10 years. <laughs> I just wrote my stuff. I went to the studio and I watched it and then I was just like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm lucky to be here. But, uh, well, that, well, that's a good feeling because uh, yeah. like I, I've, I've heard, I think it was Joey Mazzarino who said that the moment that you walk on the set of Sesame Street, you become five like immediately, no matter what age you are. It's 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 the best thing. And, and also to see something like, you know, you write this stuff sitting at home in your, you know, basement or whatever. And then you, you come to the studio and there they are and and they're like all of these talented people performing it. Or if I if I wrote a song, then, you know, you you come in, they've set it to music and they're talented singers singing it and performing it. It was, it was just so exciting. Um, and the best thing, you know, there are a lot of, um, it's not an open studio, but people will occasionally bring kids to see the show and the kids, you know, like I remember Carol Spinney standing there with his um, bird legs on mm -hmm. and the, his top off. <laughs> and you know they don't they don't even notice the bird legs and then they put the rest of the bird on him and suddenly the kid is seeing big bird but when mm -hmm. they take that off the kid doesn't even it's like that he's wearing shoes you know like a guy wearing <laughs> shoes they just didn't it was just ama it, amazing to watch the puppeteers relate to the kids everybody was it was just the way you would hope that it would be on a show like that where everything was about you know the kids and making the kids happy and you know relating to kids it was really um great it was really fun mm. or or with the puppets you know you know kevin clash could sit there with elmo and the kid just doesn't notice kevin they just notice elmo <laughs> you know the kid will talk just to the puppet and they they don't even see the puppeteer it's just That's so wild. cute yeah, it's mm. just the imagination, I guess. Mm. So did you have a favorite character to write for during your time on the show? I think my favorite was Oscar the Grouch. Mm -hmm. um, because it just, you know, any contrariness that is in your soul is like, it it can be <laughs> filtered through that. You know, mm -hmm. I, I loved, um, I just, I just loved writing for him. Um mm -hmm. And who else? I love writing for Grover. Mm -hmm. You know, Grover's a great character. Big Bird was the hardest character to learn. He's yeah, that's what a lot of the writers have told me, that uh, they had a yeah. hard time writing for Big Bird. Yeah, he's kind of multifaceted, I guess. And it was, yeah, it was interesting. Mm hmm but it's it's cool uh, that Carol Spinney, you know, he did the happiest character on the street, which would be Big Bird. And then right. the character that everybody would want to get the heck away from on the street because he would tell them to. 
Right, right. Mm. But still, the, just that that magic of uh, of like what you were saying with with Carol when he would wear the Big Bird pants on the set, and then he put the the puppet over his head, and then people would be just like, "Oh, it's Big Bird." I heard a story that uh, Noel McNeil is actually the one who uh, shared it with me that um, a kid comes to the set who wanted to meet Oscar, and Carol's got the Oscar puppet on his hand, and he goes, "Hey, how you doing?" The kid's like, "That's not Oscar, but th- that's an Oscar puppet." Where, where's the real Oscar? It's like waiting for the big stars to come out. And Carol's wow. like, oh, just a second. So he goes to the can with the puppet on his hand, pops it up, and instantly the kid is talking to the, quote, real Oscar. Wow. Uh, yeah, I can I can totally, I can totally believe that. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, mm-hmm. it's just, it was great. The, oh, the other character that I loved writing for and they don't really use anymore is Telly. That seems um, to be a favorite among a lot of the writers. <laughs> I think because, you know, every, you know, writers are, you know, neurotic and anxious people in general. Not not just writers, film workers in general. Yeah. And so then you, then you, everything, he just represented all of that. Like you could just let all of that out. It was just, it was so great. I I really wish they would, they had kept using him. Marty's a wonderful actor and puppeteer. Yeah, he really is good at uh, bringing out all of the emotions out of telly. Yeah, Mm -hmm. amazing. So uh, I'm going to mention a couple of uh, episodes of Sesame Street that you had written, and uh, I'm bringing them up because as I was researching for this, I work in the film business. I want to be a script writer. I've written some really, really great uh, sitcom ideas, movie ideas. And more mm-hmm. often than not, I base them off of the people that I know and what they go through and myself. I mix a little bit of all that together. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of the episodes that I want to bring up, I feel like are very relevant to um, ch- uh, children's development. And even as they grow up into uh, uh, old, into like teenagers or adults, you know, it's still relevant. Uh, so to start off, um, you wrote the episode where Gina studied to become a veterinarian and that later became a big part of gina as a character because we got to see more of her as a vet uh how was it established that that was what she was going to do um if i remember you know a a lot of these things like in terms of decisions about what characters are going to do came out of writers meetings where um you know the people would throw out ideas i don't i'm I'm sure it wasn't my idea for her to become a vet but then it's once the decision is made then they need somebody to, you know, write the show where she becomes the vet or where she's in the whatever. And um, so I I think that's, that's generally, that's, I can't take credit for having, you know, thought of that, but it's usually just trying to figure out what she could do. Um, We had a lot, lots of different meetings over the years, every time the show changed, um, you know, about, like what extra cast do we need? What kind of job would be interesting to a kid and like a veterinarian oh. bringing all the animals in and all of that, um, you know, it was just a natural, I think, for kids. Mm-hmm. My uh, very best friend is studying to become a vet. She's in her final year now at University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Oh, oh wow. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. So that that's one of the reasons that I uh, thought about that particular episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, recently I interviewed, um, I don't know if you've ever seen or heard of Caillou. I have, I haven't, if I've ever watched it, but yes, I have. I I watched Caillou as a kid and one of my previous guests was Pat Fry, who does, uh, Caillou's dad. (laughs) A lot of my friends were like, why? All Caillou ever did was just complain. Um, (laughs) and it is, let's be honest. It is really hard to, um, even think about Caillou as an adult without thinking about how much of a complainer he was. Um, and I did bring that up with with Pat. I said, you know, as I was researching for this, I saw online that Caillou gets a lot of hate for being whiny. And he told me that one of the uh, reasons that they kept going with that was because they, uh, according to the ratings, the viewership of Caillou was high among uh, girls who were trying to become babysitters and were watching Caillou for uh, uh, child care tips. Oh, that's wild. That's mm. really yeah, and it, and that kind of reminds me of um, an episode that you had written with Snuffy sister Alice, where Alice was throwing temper tantrums up the wazoo, um, and you know, like that's I, I feel like that episode, of course, would have been done for the parents as well, because it would have been like, okay, how do or or maybe for the teenagers who are babysitting. I was talking to um, 
somebody about that just the other day. Um, so how do you remember how uh, that episode came to be like uh, and what research had to be done for it? These are really old episodes. I don't need, I, <laughs> <laughs> I believe you that you say I wrote them, but I don't remember uh, much about that. And I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of times um, the research department would have, you know, that we had this big curriculum and they would be talking about different um, developmental stages or things that kids have to deal with. Um, I can't remember what year that was written in, whether my kids were born yet. Um, cause some of the ideas that I had, um, you know, came directly from the, having, having kids. And mm -hmm. like, I, I once did an episode where Big Bird kept, um, climbing into Gordon and Susan's bed. Like, so he'd come out of his nest and he would climb at the time when my daughter was doing something similar. So it was like, you know, Gordon would fall on the floor and Big Bird would be in the bed, you know, and Gordon would end up in the nest, um, it was sort of like that. And I don't know if, if it was at a time like when my son was having tantrums or something, but um, I, my guess is that it probably came from a, a researchy sort of talking about different stages. Um, mm. Because it, because it is interesting when you said, you know, like um, having kids, you know, like, and you were basing stuff off of what your, what your kids would do. Well, that's like in my case, like I, when I write, I base it off of, uh, the first thing I wrote when I realized that this is what I wanted to do came out of, um, I don't know how much I should say. Let's just say something that uh, went on in my high school that I was like, holy shoot. And I just kind of took that and wrote like this movie script totally based on it. Right, right. Well, you know, it's the old write what you know kind of thing. But there Exactly, are, you know, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. you just get, you can you can get there really quickly with, with the emotions and all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, well, talking about uh, kids' reactions, um, you wrote a home video where Big Bird, Elmo, and Gordon paid a visit to a firehouse to see the day-to-day -day workings of the firefighters while they're waiting on a call for a fire. And eventually they get one, and they're actually brought with the firefighters to the site of the fire. And little do they realize how actually frightening it can be for a kid. Um, right. Can you talk about doing that one? Um, again, long, long time ago. But, <laughs> Hence um, the name of the show, Nostalgia Talk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, you know, I wrote like, you know, tons and tons of shows since then. But that <laughs> video, um, which was uh, produced by Nina Elias, who was a, a wonderful, wonderful producer at the workshop then, um, yeah, we went out to um, New Jersey and we we shot that. We you know with the with the um, I think it was shot in Newark, as a matter of fact. And I, if I recall, the mayor of Newark came and gave us a visit while we were. While wow. We were yeah, it was like you know big big production. So um, so that firehouse was actually like and, and the site of the fire. I mean, hopefully it wasn't a real fire, but that was like where that was like on location. Yeah, that cool. was done on location, which was which was really cool. And I remember, you know, we we got a lot of information about what what firefighters do when they're not fighting fires. That's where um, that's where the, I think I wrote a song waiting for the waiting bell for the bell to ring. Yeah, I have a um, copy of uh, that tape, I think, in this very room. Oh, well, um, Steve Lawrence wrote the music for that. Um, and. Yeah, so there was a whole thing about how how firefighters like to cook and they played ping pong and so that's that's where that I remember that that's where that came from. Um and I know that years later I think I think the they did a fire on the show that John Weidman wrote also. Is that know, the one where there was a grease fire at Hooper store? Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that new and um like I I I really felt Elmo's emotion. Uh I was talking to Lou about this because um, uh, right before I uh, had him on the show, the first time I've had Lou on this podcast twice, actually, oh. um, I asked him and Marty Robinson, who was a previous guest, uh, I had this idea to do a retrospective on the Slimy to the Moon series. I don't know oh, where that yeah. came from, but because Lou was the head writer and Marty was Slimy's puppeteer, I emailed them and I was like, hey, guys, you, you guys want to do this with me? And so the three of us did it together individually, but we still did it together. Um, but uh, I really cool. felt... I really felt Elmo's emotion 
when he's looking at Hooper's store and Alan was saying, you know, uh, okay, let's uh, let's get back to lunch. And Elmo's just standing there stiff as a board. And Alan and Maria were like, Elmo, you, you okay? Elmo's like, I can't do Elmo's voice. Elmo doesn't want to go back into Hooper's store ever again. And I felt that like uh, once I saw something happen on my street and um, it was um, even as even as like a 22 year old, I was still I still felt that emotion. Like, I don't want to walk down that corner for a while. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the uh, but yeah, the emotion of uh, witnessing uh, something like that, like it's frightening. Uh, I remember Elmo and Gordon, you know, saying at the fire in the home video. Uh, fires are scary, but it looks like they got this one under control. And even Big Bird right. was like, I sure hope I don't have a fire in my nest. Right. Right. I mean, it's a, we, you know, I mean, that's a, a great thing that the workshop's always done is they take on things like that. So, you you know, with these characters that, that represent the child and how the child's feeling and, um, and with a lot of guidance from, um, you know, research in, in, especially on those kinds of shows where, where you have to really get it right. You know, you have to really, you really have to get, we, we did the series of shows, um, the hurricane shows. Oh yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, after, I guess that was after nine 11, you know, mm -hmm. and where something was that, no, no, it must've been after a hurricane, but it was, um, sorry, my memory, but, um, it's all good. It was, yeah. <laughs> Those were, again, it was like, you know, I think I wrote the show where, where Big Bird goes in and, and sees that his nest has been destroyed, his nest, you know, mm -hmm. his nest, his home. And, you know, you just feel it. You you just feel it through that character. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they really are uh, good at that. Uh, I'm, of course, thinking about the uh, Mr. Hooper episode that uh, that Norman had written. Yeah. Uh, not too long ago, I lost one of my friends, uh, with whom I went to junior high and high school with. Mm. And, um, you know, like, and I, I hadn't been close with this person in a very long time, but, um, you know, I like, I, I rewatched that clip of the adults telling big bird that Mr. Hooper had died for comfort. Cause you know, mm -hmm. here's big bird. Who's never, I've, it's not often that I've, that I've lost many of my friends. So here's big bird that thank God. Uh, so here's Big Bird, like who's never had this happen to him. And the adults are having a really hard time explaining to such a young mind um, about it. So, yeah, yeah it's yeah, it's yeah. it's great that the show tackles these uh, these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So <laughs> this might seem like kind of a deep cut question when it comes to episodes of Sesame Street that you've written. Um, <laughs> what was it like to write the Apprentice episode? Oh, so much so much fun in it so it, it's it's so funny because I, that's one of the things that i think um i loved most about writing for the show was doing parodies doing the parodies um, yeah and i think that i think that um i think that kathy Thoreau had written the original thing with donald grump i think she where he had come to sesame street and he was you know building condominiums or whatever and he was like ruining it was like a whole <laughs> thing but i guess when the apprentice came around um there was that character so i got to do you know i got to to do a whole show about that and it was so funny and i i i do remember i think that was the show that um when was, um, I, there was some some i think that got a lot of uh blowback at some point um i can't I can't remember why, but it, it sort of when Trump came back, I think it it just also people kept resurrecting that the bit of that, you know, <laughs> kept resurrecting that <laughs> character and and um you know, which had been written so so long before, but um it really, really was so gratifying. <laughs> when I interviewed Marty um the first time, uh I asked him, I usually ask a lot of the Sesame Street puppeteers, is there a character that you've performed one time and one time only? that really is stuck in your memory. Marty mentioned a few and then he says, this one's safe to say these days because it was after Joe Biden's inauguration. He's like, I played Donald Grump and after, <laughs> uh, shall we call him Mr. Orange got elected, uh, I asked the creative staff, uh, I know the answer is no, but I have to ask, can we bring back the Donald Grump character? And all everyone was like, not gonna happen. <laughs> 
Yeah, they would never do that these days. Yeah, I can't imagine <laughs> never, why. Never. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Well, to be honest, I mean, Lou is the head writer at the time. My beef's with Lou on this one. <laughs> Sorry, Lou, if you're listening, just saying. Um, talking about the parodies of Sesame Street, um, what were some of your favorites to write? Oh, my gosh. I did... Um... Well, what... <laughs> One thing I, this wasn't one of the inserts, but I did a show where Oscar and Grungetta um, get married and, um, and they have Oh the yeah. Pam, Pam Marciero Mar brought that one up when she came on the show. Yeah. And Martha Sewer was the, you know, the parody <laughs> of her, and she, you know, <laughs> that was so much fun that, and I did parodies of, you know, songs from like, I'm getting married in the morning from my fair late. I mean, like just, it was just so much fun. <laughs> And the and in the end they decide not to get married because they would be too happy. They would be too happy. <laughs> and you know, they couldn't stand that. So I loved that. I did I did so many um I you know, like I did I think Birdwalk Empire, uh God, I did so many of them. I oh, I I, re I remember Birdwalk Empire. That one was clever. The the funny thing is that if I you know, I I did the a parody of the I don't even know if this one aired. Um, I did a parody of The Walking Dead, and oh, uh, um, Walking Walking Gingerbread. Yeah, yep, that and one aired. It did air, yeah, because it was at the time when when new management was coming in and they were starting to get sort of skittish about doing parodies at all. Mm -hmm. And I did Orange is the New Snack, um, and I had to watch. Well, I had to watch The Walking Dead, which is just the, I would never watch a show like that. And my, you know, my, I was watching these things and my husband in the next room is hearing like, you know, people screaming and how they, you know, they behead all of those Walking yeah. Dead. You know, and, and Boardwalk Empire also was so violent, although I loved that show, but I, you know, I watched it because I, I wanted to write a parody of it, I would always think of the name first and then I would have to watch the show to see what, how I could do a parody of it. And um, that's just the most, the most fun for me. Um, you know, and you, and there's no place where that lives anymore, you know, where you could really do that anymore, but uh, boy, it was, it was really fun. Mm. So uh, do you have any um, uh, favorite celebrities that you worked with on the show? Um. Well, for a while, every time I wrote something for a ce celebrity, they canceled or they got. Oh, <laughs> damn. So I went through a series of that. Like they, I did a, a Steve Martin thing and I think something for Roseanne where then she was. So, um, but I, yes, I, I wrote something for Liam Neeson. Um, and I wrote, I wrote a, a bit for John Goodman, um, where he was a member of the Triangle Lovers Club, and he was with Telly, that was, he was great. Um, the the I, Liam Neeson oh, bit, by the way, was that uh, the one with the Count? I think there was a bit where the Count was directing a movie, and he had Liam Neeson play him. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think that was one of the first things from Sesame Street that I ever saw. Oh really? Because I now I can't remember what I did for him. Um, I I don't think so, but okay. I had would have to look at look it up. Um, the other thing I, I did that Katy Perry song um, that she did with Elmo, and then they had to they had to they took it off the air because I mean it's had millions of views. It lives on on YouTube. Um, and it's had so many millions of views, but sh she, something that they dressed her in, they felt wasn't appropriate. And so it, was, it got taken off the air. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm trying to remember who else. Well, my mother would kill me if I didn't ask about this one. Uh, you wrote the uh, episode with Anderson Cooper where he was uh, co-hosting GNN with Oscar. My yes. mother's a huge Anderson Cooper fan. <laughs> And you know what was funny about that? He was like, he was like, he walked on the set and he was like, the way everybody responds, like you're five years old. He was just, he had watched the whole thing. He wanted to go in Oscar's trash can. Like he just <laughs> seemed like he was. I've he seen that that's really... like a regular photo op for anybody who comes onto that set, Oscar's trash yeah. can. 
I mean, he was just really, you know, he was just excited, really excited. I guess he had watched the show as a kid and he was really excited about it. That's funny. Uh, so you wrote a lot of episodes also that featured uh, classic nursery rhyme characters such as Humpty Dumpty and Jack B. Nimble. I'm, th of course, yeah. thinking about the episode where Humpty Dumpty tried to play football or um, one of my particular favorites with any of those characters is um, Jack B. Nimble at the movies. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Basically, it was a movie. It was like a parody of 21 Jump Street. And um, the usher had said, you know, you're supposed to sit in your seat, you know, watch the movie, listen to the movie. And, and every time. Sit. Yeah. Uh, so can, sit that's right. So can yeah, you talk yeah. about can you talk about how you work them into the story? Um, You know, it, it really comes from, you know, something that I want to write about like i i uh i did a thing where uh jack b nimble falls off of his um or he, he where he suddenly he falls when he's trying to go over the candlestick and then he can't he can't get back um he can't get his like jump back he can't get his nerve back to keep doing it so sometimes it comes from something like you know just like an idea and then thinking of of which character you know, would fit that, would have that kind of anxiety, like, uh, <laughs> um, or not being able to sit still and then thinking, always thinking, you know, when you put them together with something else, some other character and what the comedy is or, or the situation, the comic situation of not, of having a character in a movie where where they won't sit still, you know, it's, it, it's hard to, it's hard to describe where ideas come from, but um, I usually start with it, you know, I, I might take a particular nursery rhyme character and then think of what their what their issues would be, what kind of problems would they would would affect somebody from that, you know, like uh you know, Gladys trying to jump over the moon. Like what would what would what would that what's that character feeling and what would their problems be? What are their issues? Um and that's you know that that was always a big place where things came from for me well that's very clever um because you know like it's relevant to the classic nursery rhyme uh of course you know with humpty dumpty and football he's an egg football is a very very <laughs> violent sport prone to tackling right <laughs> And um, I love doing it. Like I love when the all the king's horses and all the king's men <laughs> always come running in. I just, literally every second, yeah. <laughs> right, right. It's just like, uh. When I uh, had Leslie Carrara Rudolph on, I asked her the same question I asked Marty. Um, any characters that you did one time and one time only that stuck out in your memory? And um, she mentioned one that you had written, Minnie Minor Bird, in an episode where um, this character, as soon as Big Bird leaves his nest, this Minnie Minor character takes over the nest and Big Bird's like, uh, pardon me, that's my nest. And Minnie's like, it was empty. Your fault. It was empty. <laughs> right. And uh, Leslie talked a little bit about um, how that episode came to be. She said that uh, it was she believes that it was around the time of gay marriage. And uh, that bird, and so the, the the basic episode was about like bird law, uh, but at the same time, it was also uh, how she described it was it was around the time of legalizing gay marriage. Huh. I I'm not I don't remember that, but I do remember having um, we had like like judge birds, like Supreme Court birds, <laughs> so that may have been where that where that came from making you know talking about the the law and what what you can do as a bird and what's what's not right so i do remember um i do remember doing a parody of the justices for that if i'm if i'm remembering correctly um i'm not sure why that would relate to to gay marriage per se well maybe it was around the time that uh the supreme court was actually trying to legalize it perhaps maybe I mean, I've, I'm, I'm very uninformed about law. I'm going to be honest. Yeah, I just I, despite I, the I, fact I, that I'm a despite the fact that I'm a bit of a Judge Judy watcher, I'm very uninformed oh. about law. <laughs> and we should have parodied her. That would be <laughs> that would um, be hilarious. I mean, like getting all of her catchphrases in there. Like, uh, what do you do for a living? Um, um is not an answer. Yeah, <laughs> that was actually my first ever voiceover gig was imitating Judge Judy because uh, I on on the first show that I ever worked on, 
it was a very, very small staff with five production assistants, including me, who were doing literally everything, assisting with camera, assisting with sound, assisting with props. Like literally you get called over and it's like, okay, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. Um, and uh, because it was just a little short form uh, series. And then we had this animated character. It was a mix of cartoon and live action who was a ghost. And the director's like, we just need somebody to read the lines and then we'll have an actor uh, dub it over. And um, I was like, oh, I don't mind reading the lines. And then I read the lines in my head to kind of know what to do. And it was a character who was a ghost. So I did this really ominous kind of thing in my mind. And then I was like, I like this. I went over to the director and I was like, can I play the character on the actual thing? Like, in like... <laughs> Can I be the one that does the overdub? And instead of um, having me overdub it, we did it live. And um, I gave them the ominous voice. And uh, <laughs> uh, they said to me, okay, James, just say something into the mic. He wanted me to do the ghost voice, but he didn't tell me. So mm -hmm. I went in, I went, um is not an answer. And they're like, do that. I'm like, no, I am not <laughs> doing Judge Judy to play this character. <laughs> they would not let me do anything else. And I've never been able to live it down by them. Oh, that's so funny. That's great. Yeah. I beat you to the Judge Judy parody then, I guess. <laughs> so um, how did you come up with the idea for the UK spinoff, uh, Furchester Hotel? How did that all happen? Ah, uh, well, that started... Um... It started with a group of, of writers. They were... We were, I can't remember exactly. We were, it was like Tony Geis and I think Judy Freiberg. Um, and we were, we were asked to, um, I guess, come up with some sort of I ideas. And, and it, so originally we wrote this, like, we wrote it like a hotel brochure. Joey might've been in there too. And, and we, we, you know, the pitch was like a brochure and it was, it was really funny and it, kind of got put in a drawer for a few years. And um, I think by the time they resurrected it and, and decided, um, I think, I think the original thing, I think Arlene Sherman had asked us to do, and I can't remember why, like what the purpose was. I think she was trying to sell, they were trying to do like a seven o'clock hour show, like a, a family spinoff, something that would, wasn't particularly a, a children's show. If I'm, if I'm so kind of, so kind of like Sesame Street at prime time. Yeah, and they that would they, be interesting. <laughs> would be great, you know, but they, they, I think she tried to pitch it and it, it didn't get any traction, and then it was resurrected um, years later by uh, Carolyn Parenti and Dion Nosek, and by then I think I was, um, and and Terry Fitzpatrick was. Um, overseeing the whole thing and they wanted to by then I think I was the only one left there and oh. they wanted to do um I or Joey might have still been there and I they wanted me to do a pitch for the for CBBS which is the children's um network for BBC so I did um you know I did an I took the original but I then had to come up with a, they wanted it to be a kid's show again they didn't want it to be um and i think you know what you know what it was i think the furchester started on around the corner that's what it was it started when we went around the corner there was that hotel there. oh yeah the uh the furry arms right um they couldn't use the furry arms as a name because in the UK that's more of a bar, you know, like it's a, it tends to be more of a bar. So they, we had to come up with a different name. <laughs> so um, I did Furchester instead of a uh, furry arms was like the perfect name, but we couldn't use it. If it was a bar uh, it would be perfect if it was a primetime show. Right. So that's what we were trying. Originally, that's what we were trying to spin off into a, into a, um, a you know, a more, um, adult not adult but family show but they came back and they got the idea to do this as um as a children's show and they they had a inroads into cbb's and so i i just had to redo and start from scratch really with i had to create all of these um characters 
um, that weren't in the original pitch, but in, and weren't working. We, I don't think anybody I'm trying to think if anybody was working at the original hotel, and we had to add um, Cookie Monster and Elmo because they wanted to have a, a connection to the street. So we had to come up with a like a, a reason why. Elmo would be at the hotel to begin with and Cookie Monster, you know, like it, it was, it was just, you know, we always have to deal with the logic behind it. It couldn't just be that Elmo lives there because he lives on Sesame Street. So it was a sort of a thing where, where they were visiting for a long period of time. And I, I mm -hmm. think the main character on the Furchester, maybe we said was Elmo's cousin or something. Anyway, it was, it was. Um, yeah, it was a, Elmo's cousin and uh, Elmo's cousin's parents, uh, Fenella right. and Fenella Fergus. And Fergus, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it they made this exquisite set, this like life-size set. It was like a hotel you'd want to check into. It was amazing. It wasn't just like a puppet, even though there were no humans. It was just, it was like a life-size hotel, beautiful like 360 set it was just beautiful um and it was so much fun to do it was really you know we did it in um Salford which is outside of Manchester where some of the BBC's programming is and we worked it was a co-production with people from CBBS who were just you know great um producers and directors um in fact one of the Furchester directors ended up coming over and I and I I'm not sure if he still is but he was he was directing on Sesame Street for a little while after oh, that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um mm -hmm. well they also uh, Sesame Street also got uh, another uh Furchester alum, shall we say, from the actual show Gonger eventually. Yes. Yes. Um and that was, you know, I had this I had this idea that every every that months about monster tea time and the monsters would just, you know, go flying through the hotel um you know for tea to to get to tea right and gonger <laughs> gonger we had to have somebody who would who would sort of uh hit the gong and that's when they would they would everyone would drop everything and the monsters would would like run to run to get into the dining room to get their tea um you know it was just part of the chaos it was just a, a bit that um and they had like a little song that they did or whatever. And I think it was, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was David Rudman was playing Gonger at that time. And he kind of, he really made, for me, it was just a group that began, you know, came with, but he, there was this little pink puppet and he really, he really got that as a character, made that into a character, um, you know, that, you know, not verbal speaking monsterese, but, um, and he brought so much comedy to it. And then they, then they, he didn't play him, I think, after they spun that out, uh, you know, had them come to the street. Um, I think it was Warwick who, who was doing it by them, but. Um, and he still is. Yeah. Yeah. He's still on the show. Yeah. I think he and Carolyn had the, had the idea for that, for that food. I was wondering that if, uh, if you were involved in that as creator of the Furchester, like if there was any, uh, if you were involved in any talks about getting any of those characters on the actual street. No, they came up with that idea and they, they pitched it and I kind of found out about it just kind of secondhand. I, I didn't have anything to do with it, but um, yeah, no, it was, it was great. Uh, it was a great thing. And then, then it just became, it was a very expensive show. Um, well, I bet. Yeah, and so those, they, I, 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 I've watched a little bit of it because it did end up coming to, here to Canada. The sets look massive. Like it's so much like the inside of an actual uh, hotel. Like as I remember on yeah. the furry arms, everything was like puppet sized. Right. Um, it's funny. One of my favorite Sesame Street episodes ever was where Gordon and Susan were staying at the furry arms. And I remember one scene they had a little bit of a hard time getting in. Yes. Yes. I mean, that that was what was that was so much so much fun um yeah and some of those ideas like we had this revolving door that was supposed to you know the puppets were supposed to spin around and then they get shot into the hotel <laughs> um, but research was sort of nervous about that so it was we didn't yeah, get to, it's some a little, of the fun I get, stuff yeah i get I, well yeah sometimes fun can be dangerous but that's what yeah. makes it fun let's be honest right and i never think about that you know it's only just like what's what's the best mm -hmm. visual we could have mm -hmm. um 
so yeah, that, that was really a, that was really a, a fun thing. And so we did two seasons of it, but then they decided it was too, too uh, expensive. And also I think the management at, at Sesame had changed by then. So mm. that was that, that was, that was sad. I would have loved to do a few more seasons of that. At least we still have Gonger. So, you know, yes. the, <laughs> that, that lives on. Right. Uh, to to wrap up the uh, Sesame Street talk uh, before mm-hmm. moving before moving on to some of the other projects that you've worked on, uh, one of my friends who was a guest on this show is Ivy Austin, and um, I I talk a lot with um, Muppet people about um, my friendship with Ivy, and uh, a lot of the time they're like, "Wow, that's Danny Epstein's daughter," and they just talk very highly about Danny. Uh, so that makes me wonder because you wrote a lot of song lyrics for Sesame Street. Do you have any like memories of Danny that you'd like to share, or like, can you talk a little bit about the kind of guy that he was? You know, I didn't. I he was just a really nice, nice man. Um, I didn't. You know, as a as a writer, I didn't really deal with Danny. I I uh, would just deal with wh- whatever composer was working on my my songs, and then I would just collaborate with them and. They would go and do the music, so I, I wish I had something I could add to that, but I don't. I didn't really know him that well. That's okay. Uh, the other person that they talk about a lot when it comes to the music of Sesame Street is uh, Dave Connor because he was the vocal coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, d- did you uh, get to know him uh, at all? Just you know, just uh, again, he was a lovely, lovely man. He was always on the you know he was on the set when I they were doing one of my songs and doing the vocal direction. But I didn't really, I didn't really know him either. Okay. So um, you also uh, created the Upside Down show. Uh, how did I have watched a little bit of it? Noggin was never available in Canada, but like, and for any of the listeners who want to check out this uh, Upside Down show, you can find clips of it on YouTube. It's, uh, it's amusing. It's, uh, it's definitely a yeah, it's definitely a kids comedy show for sure. Um how how did that happen? How did you come up how did you come up with that? Well, the the Umbilical Brothers, um I don't know if you know them. They're very big in Australia and they They're the, told, are they the ones who were the hosts? Yes. They do this they're sort of like um mimes and they they do adult shows and they had been off Broadway. And Kurt Mueller, who was a creative um, director at the time um, at the workshop, had seen them off Broadway and had just this brilliant idea of taking them and making a children's show with them because they're they're like mimes, but they speak and they make all kinds of noises like, you know, one of them makes noises and the other, you know, will hit it and, you know, will like say somebody would do a fly and then the other one would try and hit the fly. And there's all this physical comedy, which, you know, kids love and the sounds and they are just two of the funniest people ever. Like if you ever get a chance to see, they do tour the world. I'm not sure if they have been in Canada, they've come to New York a few times um, and they do different shows that they've made, but, but definitely for adults. So I sat in a room with Kurt and um, Anna, Anna Housley, who was a, a curriculum person. And we tried to come up with the idea for a show for them. Um, and at some point I came up with it because they had a bit where they are operated by remote control. Oh yeah. Um, so kind of the overall thing was that I, I, I had this idea that the audience at home would operate them. And so their whole thing would be like, you know, don't put whatever they would, there would be a button in each episode that they weren't allowed to, to push, you know, like don't push the fall down button. And then, oh, you know, they would fall down and you push the, you know, like, so there was this interaction with, um, with the audience. And I I only remember showing it to my friend's son who must've been like seven at the time. And he's staring at the screen and he, he is operating this imaginary remote control, you know, like it was just total i don't know um and i kids kids who think that they want to control the world yeah i mean it just was so it was so great and and they then we had these endless number of rooms so that they're you're in their apartment but the idea is that you could go to like the 
you know, the very hairy room, and then suddenly they would have hair, and there would be a little bit there, and they it would all be in service of getting to one destination that that kids needed to become familiar with, like a museum or a barber shop or the beach. But they would take all of they were always going somewhere, but they would, and it they, it all came out of their apartment, and they would always leave through a room and and it was the wrong room and go through another portal or behind their couch to get to it. It was, they were just really amazing. I see, I see why it was called the upside down show because of all yes. the craziness like that. Um, out of what I've seen for it, my favorite was where, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Shane. I was trying to remember their names. Uh, Shane was like, uh, where's, D where's my brother, Dave? And David comes in and it's like, David, you're horizontal. Just before I say, how dare you call me horizontal? What's horizontal? Well, it's sideways. Uh, and so he tries to fix it his own way by using his feet to change the direction of the screen. And then it ends up Shane's horizontal, David's vertical, and then they switch it up. And then they use the remote and it starts with them just testing different buttons. Like, okay, the sneeze button, rewind. Kids these right. days have no idea usually how to operate a remote because now you've just got an iPad in front of them. So that's right. their definition. A phone and their iP and an iPad is their definition of a remote these days. That's that's right. And they would they would they would um ask the they couldn't operate themselves. It was the kid they would ask the kid to press right. yeah that, that's what I remembered about it because um when I was kind of re I rewatched just a little bit of it while I was preparing yeah. for this, uh, including the horizontal episode. It's an interesting way to describe it, the horizontal episode. <laughs> and um when uh, Shane is like do you want to try to push the horizontal button? I'm thinking to myself, why the hell didn't you do it yourself in the first place? Now I get it. It's more interactive. Yeah, they don't have a remote. It's the kid at home that is operating and the kid will inevitably that. press a wrong button. And no, that's not the horizontal button. That's the upside down button. And, you know, that's <laughs> how, it, how, it, how it got there. I love uh, it. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you also wrote a little bit talking about crazy shows. Uh, you also wrote a little bit for the Wubulous world of Dr. Seuss. Um, what was that like? Was it as Wubulous as it sounds? It was a very chaotic production. I think they were. They Can't were, be as chaotic as the Upside Down show. The production itself, the, the production of the Upside Down show was, you know, Michael Boucher in Australia was the executive producer. I think he also named the show, the Upside Down show. Um, ran like clockwork. Furchester ran like clockwork. Um, the Wubulous world, they were doing a lot of, um, I, I guess they were doing a lot of green screen and they were having a lot of technical difficulties. So the the actual shoots themselves were were difficult, was chaotic because they were trying new things and it was and it was difficult to get, you know, like the, the actual day of production was hard. Those scripts were, I loved writing, I wrote a couple of those shows and what I loved was um, they were all in rhyme, which is really a challenge. I mean, it's really hard to do, but so I'm such a Dr. Seuss fan. And then that's also, you know, it's sort of like um, daunting that you're gonna write something when Dr. Seuss was so brilliant, and then how do you mm -hmm. how do you write something that resembles Dr. Seuss when he was like on another planet in terms of brilliance? So, because he because really... if he was stuck on a word, he would just make one up. And I mean, like with right. you as as writers, I mean, like I did, did you find that that did you find that that was kind of difficult uh, to do that to just rhyme something? And you're like, oh, nothing rhymes with this. No, it's actually it's easier if you can make it up. If you can make Fair up enough, a, yeah. You can't find a can't find a rhyme, then well, you just make up a word, and then that in that world, it's that's fine. <laughs> but um, but it was really that was really really fun to write those scripts. Mm -hmm. But because it was all like green screen stuff, because uh, you know, like I I I've seen like in how you write stage directions, like moves to one corner of the room, or. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and like I've seen behind the scenes of Wobulous World of Dr. Seuss, because it was all green screen, did you like find that it was hard to write? No, because, you know, as a writer, I, I really, I really didn't take any of that into, into my, 
head, you know, like I just, I just write the scripts and then it's sort of like a production problem that it's, you know, okay. I, I mean, there's certain things that I've learned over the years um, or when I was doing some animated things like that you can't do that you learn along the way, but I never at that stage in my career, I didn't really know what you could do or what you couldn't do. And I just wrote it and then they would have to deal with making it, you know, come out. <laughs> making, yeah. Make, making it seem like believable. Um, right. The, the reason that I ask is because I've worked in props and set decoration uh, for a show and I had to read the scripts and um, it would say like it was a horror show that I worked on mm. and um, it would say like a uh, cuts a uh, tire with an ax. So once I started in the props department, I wasn't in the props department of that show for very long. Uh, I kind of moved positions a lot during my time on it. And um, when I was working in props, the prop guy shows me a real axe and then a fake styrofoam axe. Uh, and I'm like, OK, so this is how it looks believable without actually hurting someone. Then, Right. <laughs> uh, so to wrap it up, you're currently working on uh, Don Quixote. How's that been? Oh, that is it's great. It's really great. It's just, uh, you know, uh, Adam and David Rudman um, are the you know create co-creators of it um and and adam you know adam had rights adam's just a really nice easygoing person he's really great they're both great um i wish it's been done in chicago so i haven't been able to go to any of the tapings because i'm on the east coast but um it's it's got that sort of sesame i i know i shouldn't say it because it's fred rogers but it's got that sort of um sesame kind of um uh just ethos where where you want to make it as funny as you possibly can and go for the you know where the idea is is to make it as funny as possible and then there's always the balance with research and trying to teach while you're doing that so that's something to keep in mind but but the initial um sort of um, emphasis on humor is is really a great thing something you know that that sort of sesame sort of moved out of and donkey still has some of that so mm -hmm. that was really it's been really really fun mm -hmm. so i'm working it's, it's, on it's a it's a cute show i i like i'm i'm in my mid-20s like oh, i feel so old saying that um but no it, it is a very very cute show i didn't actually realize that it was a fred rogers spinoff when i first saw it until i saw it at the end fred rogers productions and i'm like whoa yeah and i never you know in all honesty i never watched fred rogers so i didn't i had to oh. go and sort of educate myself about the you know they they took some smaller characters and they just made them into puppets you know so so they they're like great puppets um they're not the same Puppet, they they're not the same as they were on Fred Rogers show it's sort of like mm -hmm. they they took those characters sort of lesser known characters on Fred Rogers and they built a whole a whole show out of it um so and it's just it's it's one of those things like I I've just gotten to be very fond of the characters you know I I get attached to all these characters and so yeah, as you get to know them better and what they would do it's really uh it's been really nice to write for did you uh, happen to see the uh, movie where Tom Hanks was doing Fred Rogers? Um, I did. I watch that. I, I think. Yeah, I think I the, did. The, so I it was. Remember. It was. Yeah. Uh, Fred yeah, yeah, was yeah, yeah. Uh, being interviewed by a reporter who had a tough life, and he really changed his life around. Uh, yes. And of course, he's showing them. He's showing that person the actual puppets. Uh, and, you know, like puppeteering, the way that it's uh, done now has, you know, really changed because, you know, with puppets like Daniel Tiger, Don Quixote, the king, uh, you know, it's just you just put your fingers inside of it and it moves from there. Uh, with Don Quixote, I can imagine it's a lot more physical. And with, with like with like what you were saying, you know, it's very Sesame Street esque. Um, and of course, because of that, because uh, it's, it's Sesame Street's like that, too. Yeah, I mean the I think the whole Fred Rogers thing was supposed to be like the kind of puppets that that I had growing up as a kid, like just a hand puppet, you know, and you would just that kids played with. So um as opposed to Sesame Street where they really are full on characters, you know, they they their mouths move and they come alive and that's it's like I, I feel like it's a, a totally different character uh, a totally different area. Mm -hmm. Um 
uh, so the Don Quixote things are more, you know, there is they have some beautiful puppets and they're more like of the Sesame Street style. Mm, yeah, it's it's a it's a cute show. It's a very cute yeah, show. Yeah, it's it's cute. It's fun. Mm. Well, that's uh, all I've got here. Is there anything you want to say to finish? No, just thank you for having me on. I, I I'm sorry. I, there's so much that I've forgotten, but. That's all right. It's, it, it, forgot. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, it, I mean, it is great to get in tune with uh, with your own nostalgia, of course. Right. That's right. Which, of course, is why I wanted to have you on, you know, to, as we say, talk nostalgia. <laughs> right. Right. Mm. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Belinda. Uh, and to all you all of, blah, 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 blah. and to all of you listeners out there, it's getting harder to say every time. Uh, to all of you listeners out there, next up, episode number 85. So stay tuned for that. And for announcements on uh, future guests, you guys know where to go. Links in the description to our social media pages. And I'll see you next time. Peace out. Thanks. <laughs>